as we open this sermon time, I want to ask you guys a question, and that is, how do you worship while you weep? How do you worship while you weep? You see, we all have times of trial, we all have times of difficulty, we will all have struggles in this life, but how is it that we worship and praise God in the midst of those trials? How is it that we turn our affections and our praise to God when it just seems like the world is crumbling around us? Well, as we flip open in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, we are continuing in our series through the book of 1 Peter. I want us to see how Peter instructs us how we are to worship in the midst of the storm. This will be kind of a two-part sermon. And it's kind of praise and perilous times because really we're covering one section of Scripture and we're just breaking it up into two weeks. And this morning we will be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 as we see how we are to praise our God when things seem difficult. Now, the perilous times part, that's really going to come more next Sunday. We're, we're going to see as he gets into the section on various trials. But as he opens, he instructs us to praise God. And he shows us how to praise God in the midst of those trials. And really the main idea I hope that we grasp as we study this text is that the gospel puts reality into perspective. The gospel puts reality into perspective. You see, he doesn't tell them, you're not really suffering trials, you should just get over it and put on a happy face. But rather, if we embrace the gospel, if we understand the truths of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, it puts all those trials, it puts all those hardships into perspective, and thus it helps us to learn how we are to praise God in the midst of them. The gospel puts reality into perspective. So without going any further, let us read what the word of God has to say to us. And never forget, when you are hearing the Bible, you are hearing God speak. Listen to the words of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is God's word for us. Let's go before him in prayer. God, you are an awesome God. You are the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. You are our savior. You are the anointed promised one. God, we praise you for that this morning. You are the God of grace and mercy. You are the God and you alone who can cause us to be born again. God, you are the one who supplies the living hope. You are the one who offers an inheritance that can never be taken away. And you and you alone are the one who provide confident assurance that's rested in your power and not in ours. But God, we confess that even as those who have been transformed by you, even as those who have been born again, sometimes we forget that living hope. Sometimes we're given over to despair and anxiety. Sometimes we forget to worship you in the midst of the storm and rather trust in ourselves or fixate on the problem rather than on our God. God, we confess that many of us Continue on sinning, not seeking rather the things that are above, but the things that are below. And God, I pray that as we meditate on scripture like this, you'd help us to fix our eyes on the gospel. God, I ask that as we study this text, you would help us to reorient ourselves back to the truth of what you've done. 
as you instructed in the book of Revelation, would we never lose our first love? But would the gospel be just as sweet to us this morning as it was when we first heard it? Or for some in here, maybe this is the first time they've heard it. And Lord, would you give them ears to hear? God, we need you desperately. And God, we ask that you would work through your spirit as we study your word, knowing that unless you move, all that we do is in vain. So God, we come to you now ready to hear from your word and expectant to hear what you would have to say from us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we go through this text seeking to learn how we are to worship while we wait, how to praise in perilous times, we're going to really focus on four main sections. And really it's one section with kind of three sub-points. But those titles will be Divine Praise, which is really the main point with our sub-points coming under it. Divine Mercy, Divine Inheritance, and divine security. So we will look at divine praise. How are we to praise in perilous times? And then the components of that we will see in Peter's praise will be pointing towards the mercy of God, the inheritance offered by God, and the security which is found in God. But let's begin by looking at divine praise. Peter opens really the substance or the meat of the letter. Last week we looked at the introduction, and now he gets into the the meat of his letter to um, his audience. And he opens with this incredible blessing, which is not tend how to think how we are to begin a letter to people who are struggling. Can you imagine if a friend came to you and they're like, man, times are really hard. I've been undergoing a lot of persecution. And your response was, praise God. Right? Kind of like, that's an odd response, but how does Peter open this letter to those that are struggling? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He opens with a doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You've sung that before, right? Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He opens with a blessing, praising God, which I think is important for us to all recognize on the front end that no matter your circumstance, God is worthy of your praise. You see, it can be easy, or maybe we deceive ourselves. I think it's probably the same in either way, but we think it's easy to praise God when things are good, right? When you get a promotion at work, when God blesses you, maybe in a marriage or another child, when things are going well, when the bills are paid, we're like, praise God, right? He's provided. But when things are hard, we often just don't think to praise. We, we get consumed with asking, and our prayers often turn entirely to petition. God, would you fix this? God, would you do this? God, I want a solution which it's not bad to ask God of things. We should certainly go before our Father to ask of things. But often in those times of trial, we don't think that this is the moment that I need to praise God. Yet Peter here, he's instructing us to praise God. And specifically, why are we to praise God? He said, blessed be the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God in light of the Son. We praise God because he's given us the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of those things that, particularly if you've been a Christian a while, we just read right over these verses, right? Like, all right, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now what he's, what's the real substance going to be? We just like read right past it, not missing that this is the meat. This is the incredible reality that we praise God in light of the Son, which... Even his title is incredible. You know that on Jesus' birth certificate, it would not have said, Lord Jesus Christ. That's his title, as well as his name, which has incredible significance. But let's consider it briefly, because this is part of why we are to praise God in the midst of hard circumstances, that Jesus is the Lord. He is the Lord. That is the title he's been given. And he is not only the Lord with lowercase l, but he is the capital L, Lord of Lords. 
And that word Lord means universal king or sovereign. Now I think the original hearers, they had a better concept of what a Lord was. We, in our society where everyone's opinion matters equally and we live in a republic and a democratic society, and we, we tend to not understand authority structures as well as they would have in this time. A Lord was in charge of everything. And this is the Lord over all the other Lords. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from the Great Commission, what does he say after he's accomplished his mission? That all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, every bit of it, has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what should be our posture before that Lord? Well, we come to him as a servant before the Master, right? We come before him on our knees with our hands open. What would you have me to do? We come before him humble and contrite. And we come before him looking for direction. We come before the Lord who has spoken to us and we say, what have you said? And I need to orient my life in light of what you have said. The Lord is in charge and we are not. The Lord is in control and we are coming under his control. You know what, one of the phrases that this New Testament used often that we tend to not like to use because it makes us uncomfortable, it's not, you know, it doesn't make us feel good, but we are slaves to Christ. And he is our master. He is our Lord, right? He is the one who's in charge and we come under his lordship. But is he a harsh ruler? <laughs> is he a burdensome king to follow? No, he is the Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus is the name he was given. Many of you probably know the root word of that, Yeshua. It comes from the same Old Testament word or character that you know of Joshua. And literally, the name means to deliver. His name himself refers to what he came to do, is to deliver, to save the people from their sins. You see, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And God, who's been given all authority in heaven and on earth, he loves us enough that he came and bore flesh incarnated in order to save his people from his sin. His very name is a testimony to the work that he came to do. That he is our savior. And we are sinners in need of a savior. And finally, he is the Christ. Which Christ literally means the anointed one. And how it's used in the scriptures over and over again is it's the promised one. The Messiah, the one whom all the Old Testament promises were pointing towards in order to be fulfilled that God was going to send someone in order to reconcile them back to the Father where Adam had sinned, there was going to be one who was going to come and make things right. One who would crush the serpent's head. The one who would restore people back to their God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And thus we are to praise God for giving us the Son. The one who is in charge. The one who saves us from our sins. The one who fulfills all the promises of God. Be careful not to read your Bible too quickly at times. It's, it's, it's important to read the scriptures. And thus sometimes you're going to digest large chunks at a time. But there's times that's worthy of slowing down. What does this mean? This is, his name and his title are wonderful realities. We should never run past those. Because it's because of who God is and what he is called... That thus we have a confident hope when times get hard. We are to praise God in light of the sun. And this divine praise now fleshes itself out really in three main points that we're going to see in this text. And that is the divine mercy of God. And then we'll look at the inheritance and security. But let's begin by looking at the divine mercy of God. So it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ According to his great, what? Mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. According to his great mercy. Now often when we think about the scriptures, we, we tend to just make grace and mercy synonymous. And really we see the grace of God amplified in the title of Lord Jesus Christ. And here he points them to the mercy. 
Now, grace is when we receive something we don't deserve. It's unmerited favor. So you think if you were to only work 10 hours this next week, but your boss were to pay you an overtime pay. All right, that's grace. You're getting something you did not work for, you did not earn or deserve, but you're be given that gift. Where mercy is not receiving the thing you do deserve. So mercy is say, for example, your company had a policy where if you're late three times, you're fired, and you're late on that third time and the boss doesn't let you go. Right? That is mercy. You're not receiving the thing that you do deserve. And here he points us to the mercy of God as he's writing to people who are suffering greatly, going through very many trials, but instructing them to praise. And let me ask you, how does the gospel in this way help put reality into perspective? Let me ask it this way. What is the worst trial you've ever been through, the hardest circumstance that you've ever gone through? Maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a season of unemployment. Maybe you're going through it right now. What's the worst trial you've ever been through? Now let me ask you, at that very moment, at the worst of the worst that it's ever been for you, were you getting what you really deserved in that moment? You see, we have sinned against this Lord, this sovereign. We have broken God's law. We have transgressed what he has set before us. And the wages of sin is death. And what we deserve is eternal damnation under the wrath of God for all time, yet he's given us grace and mercy that we are still here. And as we reflect on the mercy of our God, that helps us to praise during trials because we know, man, what I'm going through is nothing in compared to what I deserve. It's a light trial regards to what I truly deserve to be going through. As we reflect on his grace and mercy, he goes on, according to his great mercy, caused us to be what? To be born again. To be born again to a living or lively hope. Have you been born again? Now, some of you may be in here wondering, well, I've heard people talk about, you know, I'm a born again Christian. I, I've heard that phrase before. But you might, like Nicodemus, be asking, do, do I need to climb into my mother's womb a second time? How does that work? I'm already living. How can I be born again? What does that look like? Well, to understand our need to be born again, we have to understand that in our sin, we are dead. Going back to the garden as God was speaking to the first father of all creation, Adam, he said, the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And what did Adam go on to do? List, desiring to become wise and not leading his spouse. He went on to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And guess what? Is Adam still walking around? No, he did die. But so much more than that, death entered into the world in a spiritual death. Man became separated from God. Shame for sin entered into humanity. And ever since, we have been dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air. We are not following God, and we are dead spiritually. Our relationship with God has been fractured. And thus, in order, if we are to experience true life, a true living hope, we need to be born again which is what Christ has offered in the gospel. And how are we to be born again? Was well, through what Jesus did on the cross and what he did by rising from the dead. It says to a living hope, and we'll circle back around to a living hope, it says through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, what happened to Jesus is he died the death that you and I deserve. But three days later, Easter Sunday, right, he rose victoriously from the grave. And this is something that we meditate on every time we celebrate a baptism. Is in the new birth, we see this picture of dying the death with Jesus and raising to new life, being born again, participating in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection by being born again. You see, we all need to be born again. Because we are all dead. 
But what's worse than just being dead in our sin now is if we don't trust in God, if we don't trust in Christ, that we're going to face a second death. And when we die the second death, that is when we are under the judgment and wrath of God forever. The mercy will be removed at that point, and we will get what we truly deserve under the full torment of the wrath of God. But it does not need to be that way. God has offered us his son in our place. Thus, if we put our faith and trust in him, we can be born again. We can receive the gift of the Spirit. We can be indwelt with the life of God. And one of the things that produces, it says in this text, is a living hope. How's your hope doing after this past year? One of the great tragedies, I think, in the church, and I, I'm preaching to myself in this that I've been guilty of, is this last year has been marked by a lot of despair in my own spirit. But God did not save us unto a spirit of despair. He gave us a living hope. Notice that living or lively hope. It's not just this hope that's kind of out there that will be realized at some point, but we can't know it now. No, it's a living hope. A hope that helps us get through the next month and the next week and the next breath. It's a hope that ought to guide us through our life. We know how this thing plays out. We know how this thing ends. And thus, we can live these days with confidence. If you have been born again, are you living out of that living hope? Are you living more in the old self? Being given over to anxiety and fear and despair and worry. That's not the spirit that we've been saved unto. We've been saved unto a living hope. How is your hope doing? And remember, he's not writing to people that have it all together. This isn't an artificial hope of like, everything's going to be perfect. No, they were going through various trials. He's reminding them to praise God for the hope that they've been given in the midst of the storm. And that's found only through the work of the Son. It's through God's divine mercy. And it doesn't end there. You know, this is one of those texts where it's just like the grace just keeps rolling. Like, he could have said any one of these statements, and that would have been far sufficient to praise God for his wonders in the gospel. This is where I just challenge you again, don't lose your first love. The gospel that saved you, many of you, many, many, many years ago, is the gospel that you need right now in order to praise him. Amen. You need these truths, and they're wonderful. Listen to what it goes on to continue to say. To an inheritance. To an inheritance, a gift being given to only who receives inheritance, right? Family, sons, daughters. To an inheritance. Listen to the characteristics of this inheritance. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you and for me. Now, some of you may have in here received an inheritance. Maybe you had a grandparent pass away or a parent pass away that left you some sum of money. And that is an incredible gift and blessing to leave on to the next generation. Proverbs talks about the blessing of leaving an inheritance to your children's children. That's a good thing, and we shouldn't just work for this life, but we should think of those successive generations to come and how God can use our faithfulness now and years far in the future, and that's a wonderful thing. But many of you in here haven't received any sort of at least monetary inheritance in this life. What I've been so encouraged by is I've heard many of your testimonies, I've, I've began to know many of you, as many of you have received an incredible spiritual inheritance. That your parents sowed the word of God into you from an early age, and thus now you are reaping the fruit of what they have sown. And you love the Lord and are following the Lord based mainly on the work of your parents who loved you and your great-grandparents who loved you. And some of you have testimonies of a family and a heritage that have loved God for so many generations. That's a wonderful thing. That's an inheritance I hope to leave to our children, right? That they would love the Lord. And that's something that they would have learned from us 
as parents. But the problem with earthly inheritances is, is that they fade away, don't they? Even some of you know the godliest Christian families, over time, there's, there's the wayward son or the daughter. There's the, the families that go off on their own way. And that's not something we can even control. We can plant and sow, but only the Lord gives growth, and sometimes those fade away. How many of you own a personal possession from your great, 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 great grandfather? Right? I don't. And I'm guessing many of you don't. Even your most prized possession, you can leave it to your children. But after a while, what's going to happen? It's going to fade away. It's going to perish. What did Jesus instruct on his Sermon on the Mount? He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But rather, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Well, he's pointing towards the same thing that Peter's pointing towards. Because you see, even if you, say your dad had an awesome muscle car, and he left it to you, right? Over time, is, rust is going to eat that thing, right? <laughs> All the rubber on it's going to disintegrate down to nothing, right? The parts aren't going to be made anymore. Eventually, it's, it's going to go away, right? Things here on this earth don't last forever. But the inheritance that we're being offered as sons and daughters of the Lord, the King of Kings, it's imperishable. Listen to those descriptors again. It says it's imperishable, it's undefiled, and as well, it is also unfading. It's undefiled. Even that, the thing that we're receiving, it's pure, it's perfect. How many of you have received an inheritance that's truly undefiled? Even you think of the spiritual heritage that many of you have received from your parents. Did your parents give you the scriptures perfectly and were they themselves perfect in showing you the love of God? Of course they were, right? They were sinners saved by grace just like you are. Even their best efforts were not perfect. They were not totally undefiled. But the inheritance being offered to us, it's totally undefiled. It's totally perfect. It's totally clean because it's been given by the one who is spotless, who is holy, who is righteous, the one who has no hint of stain within him. It's being offered by the spotless, blemishless lamb who is slain. And it is unfading. It will never go away. It will never diminish. It doesn't matter if the Lord returns 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years from now. That inheritance is locked up. It's secure. It's not going anywhere. No amount of sun will fade that sign, right? It's lasting forever and ever. We have a divine inheritance. And where is it being stored? Where is it being kept? Is it being kept somewhere where thieves can break in and steal? No, it's kept in heaven waiting for you. And that inheritance is the working out of our and completion of our salvation. Our perfect glorification, the day where there will be no more sickness and no more sin. That day where we will be reunited with this Lord and Savior and we will dwell with him forever and ever in perfect peace, in perfect relationship where sin and suffering will be no more. Where these various trials and moments of hardship in this life, well, they're not going to be carried into that life. We have a future hope. We have a living hope. And that inheritance is guaranteed and is locked in for you, which leads to this last point on divine security. Divine security. Listen to these final verses. It says, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, if you have a pen, I would underline that, God's power, not your own, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. 
Do any of you ever struggle with assurance of salvation? Maybe you just worry. You worry. You're like, I'm a sinner. And you just feel like I'm just one or two sins away from messing this whole thing up. Maybe you just struggle with anxiety. Like, I feel like I'm just going to blow this thing. I've been given such a great inheritance. Surely I'm going to squander it, right? <laughs> Which is an incredible weight. It's an incredible burden. Can you imagine if your father left you in charge of an estate that had thousands of employees and then was worth tens of millions of dollars? That would be nerve-wracking, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you be afraid to run it into the ground? Wouldn't you be afraid of destroying this legacy which was going to be handed to you? That would be scary. That would be intimidating. But do we have to fear losing this inheritance in that way? Do we have to be scared that we're going to blow this thing in our own strength or out of our own weakness? No, it says, who by God's power, by God's power, which shouldn't surprise us. Let me ask you, are you saved by your power or by God's power? By God's. So why should we worry or fear that we aren't also going to be kept by God's power? We aren't saved based on our own doing, and we aren't kept in the faith by our own doing. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and this is not of our own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest no man should boast from Ephesians 2. We are saved by his power alone, and we are kept by his power alone. The God who saved you miraculously is able to keep you miraculously. You can trust in that. Does that mean you will be sinless or flawless? No. We have indwelling sin as believers, and we should continue to run to his throne of grace and repent and believe the gospel over and over again. But we can trust that if he made us a new person, he's not going to then kill that new person and let the old person take back over. Right? If God makes you born again, he's not going to kill you again. That's not the way his salvation works. But who, by the power of God, are being guarded? Many of you have served in the past or presently served in the military. You're familiar with the task of guarding, right? And if you are, you should be familiar with the idea that your guarding is limited, right? If you're humble enough, at least you should know that if there's only so many forces that you by yourself can defend against, right? Like maybe if you're, you're real tough, you know, if you could maybe ward off 5, 10, 15, 20, you're totally awesome, like 50, right? There comes a point, right, where you will be overtaken. And when it comes to sin in your life and the devil who wants to creep in and destroy, let me just tell you, if it was totally up to you to guard yourself in these things, you would be overtaken very quickly. We'd be hopeless. It's the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now worked at the sons of disobedience, you think that you would be tough enough in your own strength to stand against him? You wouldn't. You would certainly be overtaken. But praise be to God, that guarding is not dependent on us. It's dependent on our awesome God, who by God's power are being guarded through faith, which he not only gives us by his power when he saves us, but sustains within us as we walk with him in this new life for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And that goes back to what we were talking about last week. Often we only define salvation as that moment of regeneration, which in one sense, that is the moment we are saved, but the scope of salvation encompasses the finishing of the work as well. The final glorification when the Lord Jesus returns and sanctifies his bride and makes us whole, and finishes the work that he started once and for all. It's coming, and we can have a living hope in that. When the Lord is revealed in the last time. I love, you're probably catching on to this, I've already quoted multiple psalms in these last two sermons, but I love great hymns of the faith. 
Because as we sing these songs, we're teaching ourselves the truths of God and we're proclaiming them to others, but they just come up naturally in the everyday of life. And in studying this text, I couldn't help but think of the wonderful song, He Will Hold Me Fast. You know that one? It's one of my favorites. And the last verse of it says, For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast, raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. And that wording there that he will hold me fast, it's not quickly fast, but it's like fastening of the grip. You think of a tool that fastens, right? And we know from scripture that we are held both in the Father and in Christ's hands, and he holds us fast. And he will not let us go. And it's by the power of God that he will keep us in the gospel. So a lot of this sermon has been just meditating on these incredible realities. These things of the gospel that we, we can ascribe to. And in many ways they're lofty. And we're like, that's incredible. God did that. But if we're not, if we're not careful, those things just become things that we think about. But we don't actually know how to apply so circling back around to where we open, how does this help us worship while we wait? How does this put the gospel, help put reality into perspective? Well, I want to ask you, what at the present moment, what in your life is causing you anxiety? What is causing you distress? What is the thing that's troubling you? And maybe you're at a sweet season of life and things are going well and Praise God for that. But we know from the scriptures who all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Times of trial will come. And when those times do come, many of you have something in your life right now that's causing you distrust. Maybe it's just the culture at large or where we find ourselves politically or maybe it's something very personal. A health struggle, a struggle at work, a struggle in your family. Right? And in those moments of distress, in that, that trial, how are you going to let the gospel put that reality into perspective? Who is your God? He's a God who's in control. He's a God who saves. He's a God who offers grace and mercy. He's a God who's empowering you. He's a God who's giving you a living hope. He's a God who will sustain and keep you till the end. So in thinking of that very tangible, very practical struggle in your life, how can you let those truths of the gospel direct you to praise? The way we do that is not by ignoring the struggle. There's a temptation in some Christian circles in thinking of these sorts of things to just want to sugarcoat everything, like, just get over it. The gospel's awesome. Like, move on. That's not what God calls us to. You know, God calls us to mourn. Many of you know the shortest verse in the Bible. What, what did Jesus do? He wept. We have an entire book of the Bible referred to as lamentations. We are to go to those depths of sorrow. But what sustains us in them as we're in the valley, as we're in the pit, we have hope in who our God is and what he has done. I encourage you, whatever your trial is, think through how you can have hope in light of the gospel through that. And thus, you can be a witness to others in that. Again, I, I, I keep alluding to it because he's leading to this, but Peter is going to call us to be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is within us. Well, it's through our trial how we show others the hope of the gospel. This is an incredible witness to his glory and to the work that he's done. Are you prepared for that? Or the second when trial comes, is it like the gospel goes out the window? You need it to sustain you. You need it to give you hope in that trial. You need it to help carry you through when times are at their hardest. And a great example and application of this is many of you have probably heard about this story. If you follow me on social media, I've been sharing about it on Facebook. But there's a church up in Canada 
It's just been a great, wonderful example of how to worship and praise and exalt God in the midst of a trial. Some of you have heard of Grace Life Church up in Canada or the pastor James Coates. And this pastor was thrown in prison recently for holding church service. The government up there has an incredibly restrictive amount. I think it's like 15% that they're allowing in worship. And th their church was larger than that. And so they had the choice of either turning people away and, and just going online or something, or to faithfully meet and to gather and to share the gospel. And that's what this faithful brother did. And the, the government officials arrested him. As of right now, the, probably the soonest he could potentially get out would be May or June, but he's gonna spend months in prison in Canada, we're not talking about like the Middle East or something, like in Canada, for proclaiming the gospel. And do you know how his church and how his wife are responding? They are praising God. They're saying, look, this is an opportunity for the gospel to go forward. Now, make no mistake, his wife is suffering. A stay-at-home mom who's cooking and preparing dinner without her husband every night, going to bed by herself every night. This is an incredible trial that they are going through. Their legal fees are stacking up against this church. And do you know what? They're just committed to pressing on and proclaiming the gospel. What a great testimony of that. And we, we shouldn't be naive to think those trials will never come upon us. They may. And in that moment of trial, will we be ready to proclaim like Peter and praise our God in light of whatever circumstances he gives us as an opportunity to exalt our Savior and to take great joy in the work that he's done in the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we look up to you, Grace Life Church up in Canada, and Pastor James Coates, and I think of his wife and kids as they are suffering for the sake of your name, but doing so in such a way that is magnifying the gospel. And God, we pray that if that moment ever comes upon us as a church, that we would also be ready to stand for your truth, that we would be faithful in the midst of persecution. But God, I know more than just examples out there that in here, many of us are struggling with various trials, various heartaches, various um, things that are welling up anxiety within us. And God, I pray that you'd help us to suffer in a way that honors you. That you'd help us that in our moments of grief, that you wouldn't take away the praise from our lips. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Still, I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you help us to be ready for that? Would you help us to live that? Would you help us to offer that around the water cooler or on conversations with family members as they're despairing, as they're grieving? Would you help us to sustain that living hope that you've given us in the gospel, that lively hope? Would we have a confidence resting in this inheritance that you've given us in the gospel? And God, I think of us as a church but you've been so gracious to give us so many years of faithful ministry, church planted in 1954. God, would you help us to never depart from these truths? Would you help us to never lose that first love? Would we be rooted in the work of the gospel? Would we be secure to our living hope? Would we take grasp of that inheritance that you've given us and help that to help us get through the next day and the next week? Would you help us be dependent on you and dependent on you with joy in our hearts, even if we are suffering? It's in Jesus' name that we pray, the name that we need. Amen. Amen.